Hello and welcome back to chapter one. Today we're going to look at section 1.7 and we are going to be looking at transformations of functions. Many functions have graphs that are just simple transformations of the parent functions that we looked at back in section 1.6. For example, if you look at this graph here, my parent function is f of x equals x squared. Well, h of x, which is this graph here, is really the same thing as uh, my f of x function, except it's translated two units upward. And because it's gone up two units in a positive direction, that's actually shown right here. So I took my original function and just moved it in one direction, whether it be up, down, left, or right, to come up with a new function but it still has the same representation as the, the parent function. Likewise, again, if we look at our original function f of x equals x squared, we see that we have a parabola. And now I've taken my function and I've shifted it to the right two units. Okay, still has the same u shape, still has the same width. The only difference is I've moved my vertex from the origin over two units to the right. Now if you take note, when I move two units to the right, I represent that in the function and it's kind of attached to the function itself. So in this case, it's not just x that's being squared anymore, it's x minus 2 that's being squared. And the way I like to think about shifts that are going left or right is the sign on the shift is really opposite of what I think it should be. When I move to the right, I'm really going to subtract that value and likewise if I move to the left I'm really gonna add. So in your book you have a table that kinda summarizes all of the vertical and horizontal shifts. If you have a vertical shift and you're going upwards you're gonna take your function and add c to it or the number of units that you're shifting upwards. If we're shifting downward we're going to subtract the number of units that we're moving our function downward. Now where it gets tricky is when we're looking at the left and the right. If I'm moving something to the right or in the positive direction, then I'm really going to be subtracting the number of units that I move that parent function. And if I move my parent function to the left, I'm really going to be adding the number of units that I shifted to the left. So example one says, to use the graph of f of x equals x cubed, which is our cubic parent function, to sketch the equation g of x equals x cubed minus 1 and h of x which is equal to the quantity of x plus 2 cubed. So I'm going to go ahead and draw in my parent function right now. So my parent function looks something like the blue line. Now when I look at this function right here it says take that parent function and translate it one unit down. So what that means is, is I'm going to take this whole graph, not the whole page, but this whole graph and move it one unit down. So the point that was at 0, 0 is now going to go down to 0, 1. My point that was at 1, 1 is now going to go down to 1, 0. My negative 1, negative 1 is now going to go over to negative 1, negative 2. My point 2, 8, which is up here, is now going to go to 7. So I now end up with something that looks like this. And you can verify this on your calculator for a little bit clearer understanding. Now for part B, it says the quantity of x plus 2 cubed. So I still have my cubic function except now I'm going to be shifting my graph two units to the left because it's a positive here. So my graph then, what was at 0, 0, is now going to move over to negative 2, 0. My 1, 1 is going to move over to negative 1, 1. My negative 1, negative 1 is going to move over to negative 1, negative 3. And my 2, 8 is going to move over to 0, 8. So you're going to end up with something that looks like this. So 
So you see they all have the same shape, they're just being translated either up and down or left and right. Another type of transformation that we'll run into are reflection transformation. And if you look at this graph here, you'll see that our parent function, x squared, is actually being reflected over the x-axis. So we get something that looks like this. Okay, now that's given to us by taking the opposite of our x value. So if you look at the table here that kind of summarizes that, if we have a reflection in the x-axis, our y values are actually going to be changing signs. So our x values will stay the same, but the y values are going to change from either positive to negative or negative to positive. If we have a reflection in the y-axis, our x values are going to be changing the signs, but our y values will stay the same. So example 2 now says that the function g of x, which is shown, or shown in the figure, is a transformation of the parent function f of x equals x to the fourth. We want to find an equation of the function g of x. So with g of x, we know that the parent function x to the fourth is really a u-shaped parabola, not an upside-down u-shaped parabola. Therefore, we know that our graph is being reflected over the x-axis, so we can show that by changing the sign on our x, and it looks like I didn't move my graph either up or down, but it did shift over to the left three units. So because it shifted to the left three units, I now know that I have a graph that looks, or would follow the equation of x plus three raised to the fourth power. Again, because I shifted to the left, this symbol here really needs to be a positive because it's the opposite of what's really going on. Example 3 says to compare each graph with the function f of x equals the square root of x. Now for part a, it says g of x equals a negative square root of x. Well this graph is a reflection of the graph of f in the x-axis because if I change the sign of the function itself, I'm really changing the y values, even though x's are going to stay the same. So this is going to give me the opposite of my f of x, and this is going to tell me then that I have a reflection in the x-axis. Likewise, with the h of x, my values for x are changing, so this is telling me that I really have f of a negative x, and since the sign of my x values are changing, this tells me that I have a reflection in the y-axis. And last but not least, when we look at part C here, we have a negative on the outside of our function, which is really going to change the sign of the y-value. So this is going to give us a negative f of x plus 2. So this tells us that we have a reflection in the y-axis. And because this 2 is underneath the radical, it also tells me that I'm going to shift my function left. So we'll say a left shift of 2 units. And just to graphically confirm this, the graph of g of x equals a negative square root of x. All of the blue lines represent your original function. And you'll see that when we change the sign of the y value, it's going to re reflect it over the x-axis, just like it's done here. If I change the sign of the stuff that's inside or underneath the radical, it's going to reflect it over the y-axis. And likewise, because I changed the sign of my y value for part c, it will reflect it over but then I also added to underneath the radical, which means it's going to shift my whole entire graph two units to the left. And on a side note, I want to make sure that when we are dealing with square root 
or fourth root or any even root function, we have to make sure to restrict our domains to exclude negative numbers from occurring underneath the radical. So in other words, if I look at this right here for part A, I know that I can put any number underneath that square root symbol as long as it's a positive number. So I'm going to restrict my domain to say that x has to be greater than or equal to 0. Because I can take a square root of any number that's greater than or equal to 0, but I can't take square roots of anything that's less than 0. Likewise, if I'm going to have a negative number, or I'm, I'm sorry, if I'm going to have a negative right here, the only types of numbers that I can plug into x are negative numbers so that my negative negatives will cancel. Therefore, when I look at my domain here, I'm going to restrict my domain to be numbers that are less than or equal to 0, okay, which includes the negative numbers. For part C, it's a little bit more complicated. I just know that the, everything that's underneath the radical has to be greater than or equal to 0. So in this case, because it's more complex, I'm going to take this stuff that's under the radical, set it to be greater than or equal to 0, and then solve for x. So x must be greater than or equal to negative 2. Oops, and there's my negative. So just as a double check, if I plug in a negative 3 underneath my radical, negative 3 plus 2 is a negative uh, 1. I cannot take the square root of a negative number, so I've just proved that all of my numbers have to be greater than or equal to a negative 2. And the last thing that we're going to look at in section 1-7 deals with non-rigid transformations. The horizontal and vertical shifts and the reflections that we looked at um, earlier, these are all considered rigid. Now with rigid transformations, the actual shape of the parent function graph does not change. When we start dealing with non-rigid transformations, these are actually going to distort that parent function. And ways that we can distort our parent function is to take something like this, your function, in this case it's h of x, and if we put a scalar inside with that x, our graph is actually going to shrink if that value of c is greater than 1. So if I do like h of 3x, because 3 is greater than 1, that's going to give us a horizontal shrink. Likewise, if the number that I plug in for c is between 0 and 1, or a fraction, something like 3 fourths, 1 half, 2 thirds, and so on, then that's going to give me a horizontal stretch. Okay, now on the other hand, to get my vertical stretches and shrinks, we're going to have to take that scalar and multiply it by the function itself. So in this case, if I take that scalar c, if that scalar is a number that is greater than 1, so something like 2, 3, 10, 100, okay, this is going to give us a vertical stretch. If that number c is something between 0 and 1, like a fraction, then this is going to give us a vertical shrink. And I apologize, I did leave out the t in stretch. So for example 4, we are going to compare each graph with the function f of x equals the absolute value of x to parts a and b. Now you can do this graphically on your calculator just to confirm it, but we're going to go through this kind of like as an explanation. So right now if I look at g of x equals 3 times the absolute value of x. Now I notice that I have my c value which is going to be 3 so because c is greater than 1 and it's being multiplied, it's a scalar that's being multiplied by the function, this tells me that I'm going to have a vertical and it will be a stretch because c is greater than 1. So this here is a vertical stretch. Now on the other hand, with h of x equals 1 third times the square or the absolute value of x, 1 third is a value that's in between 0 and 1. So this tells me then that I'm going to end up with a vertical shrink. So, and 
And our last example for today says to compare each graph with the function f of x equals 2 minus x cubed to g of x. And g of x is going to equal f of 2x. So with our f of 2x, we end up with 2 minus 2x cubed. So what this is going to give us is 2 minus, remember when we're cubing, we distribute that power onto both the 2 and the x. So this gives us minus 8x cubed. And because my value here in front of my parent function is greater than 1, this tells me that we are going to have a horizontal shrink because I'm plugging the 2x in. Likewise for b, it says f of 1 half x, so this is going to give me 2 minus 1 half x to the third power, and again we're going to distribute, so this is going to give us 1 eighth x cubed, and because 1 eighth happens to fall in between 0 and 1, this tells me that I'm going to have a horizontal stretch. Okay, and this concludes our section 1.7 video. Have a good night.